Welcome to the Institute of Catholic Culture. Over 200 hours of audio presentations are available on our website for you to download and burn to a CD for use in your car or home stereo or to play on a portable player such as an iPod. If you don't know how, visit our website for some instructions or just listen to the presentations on your computer. Also available is a schedule of our upcoming events. We hope you can join us in person. All this is available at www.instituteofcatholicculture.org. This program, entitled Lives of the Apostolic Fathers, was presented by Sabatino Carnazzo, Director of the Institute at St. Michael Catholic Church in Annandale, Virginia, in March 2010. We hope you enjoy this presentation from the Institute of Catholic Culture. Father, we ask your grace and blessing upon us, especially the intercession of St. Terebius, a good and faithful bishop. Help our bishops today in this country to guide us faithfully, especially with the moral evils that hang over this country uh, with the signing the, the bill today. And we ask all this to the hands of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Hail Mary. Full of grace, full of grace to me. Bless our God, and bless the fruit of our Mary Magdalene. Who was Mary Magdalene? Uh, like the other people that we've been uh, we've been talking about, it's somewhat difficult to say. As you know, tradition, most likely you know, tradition has held her to have been um, a harlot, a prostitute. Okay, it lived a life away from God and away from her true calling. And also an icon of conversion, one who realized what she had done and come back to our Lord. The scriptures don't say that uh, explicitly. Many of the saints have talked about that, some of the church fathers, but the scriptures don't say that explicitly. We're going to be looking at her from a biblical perspective, trying to gain an understanding of why tradition has seen her in this way, what value is that for us today, and then in the second part of our program tonight, to be turning to the resurrection account in the Gospel of John. Okay, as we look towards the resurrection now uh, in the life cycle of the church, I think it's valuable for us now to reflect upon this as we head into Holy Week to have the image of Mary Magdalene, the icon of Mary Magdalene before us. One who journeys towards Christ, who awaits the resurrection as the sun rises on that first Easter morning. That we can begin to also model our lives in that way. That's what the saints are for us. As we've been looking at St. Polycarp, St. Ignatius, St. Mary of Egypt. Okay, these are people that the church puts before us because these are our true friends. They're our true friends. Why? Because they are the ones who have done with what they've been given the right thing. They are the ones who tell us the truth about ourselves, okay, in all honesty, and also love us. The saints love us. And if you walk into a Catholic church, or at least a Catholic church the way it's supposed to be built, what do you, when you walk in, you see all the saints there. Because it, the church is the home of God. And wherever God is, there are his friends. And we are one of those in the church that is a friend, hopefully, a friend of Jesus, a friend of God. And therefore, we stand there among the angels, among the saints, in the home of God. And so these saints who are looking at their lives, they're the ones, just like we model our lives oftentimes based upon the friends we have. Similarly with the saints. True friends always want to live together, live close to each other, be together. Share what they have, right? And even in, you remember probably from high school that you shared your clothes with your friends, right? They wore your t-shirts or whatever it might be. You shared your food with them when they came over the house. You might have even shared your bedroom, okay, as they slept over at your house. Friends want to share all things together. And it's no different with the saints. And so we seek in their lives wisdom for our own lives, to share in a common life, namely the life of Jesus Christ. Scripture gives us... Um, four times in which we meet Mary Magdalene. Okay, and we'll look at them very quickly. Um, in John chapter 19, verse 25. The text of the crucifixion. Go ahead. So the soldiers did this. 
But standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing near, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. Okay, fine. So there's Mary Magdalene standing there with, with the beloved disciple John, with Mary the mother of God. And so Mary Magdalene has a similar vision, huh? She's given a gift that a few others are given. That vision of our Lord upon the cross. And that must have been life-changing for her. Turn to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 27, verse 57. When it was evening, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who also was a disciple of Jesus. He went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate ordered it to be given to him. And Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen shroud and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had hewn in the rock. And he rolled a great stone to the door of the tomb and departed. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were there, sitting opposite the sepulcher. Next day, that okay, is... Okay, and so forth. So there she is. She's there at the crucifixion. She's there at the burial of our Lord. She's also there, we don't have to look at it, we'll be looking at it in a few minutes, at the resurrection of our Lord. Okay, so Mary Magdalene is kind of this, this, this one who walks us through the Triduum, right? Through the Passion and into the resurrection. In Luke chapter 8, we find out um, a little bit more about her, very little bit more, but something. Okay, Luke chapter 8, verse 1 through 3. Soon afterward, he went on through the cities and villages, preaching and bringing the good news of the kingdom of God. And the twelve were with him, and also some women who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities. Mary, called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out, and Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's steward, and Susanna, and many others who provided for them out of their means. Okay, so there you go. That was chapter 8, verse 1 through 3. So, Mary Magdalene is one of a number of women who apparently was traveling with our Lord, as he traveled around and preached, traveling with our Lord and providing, it says, for their needs. Most likely, um, what, you know, taking care of the basic necessities of food and so forth. But she was there with him on a daily basis. And we find out something else about Mary Magdalene in that text. What is it? From her, seven demons were cast out. She was a demoniac. She was, she was possessed by demons. Okay, and this gives us the first little bit of an insight into why the church interpreter, the tradition, has seen her in this way as a harlot uh, in her former life. In the chapter just before this, that leads into this text that talks about these women that were traveling with our Lord and Mary Magdalene, from whom these demons were cast out, we meet another woman. And the traditions associated Mary Magdalene, because of the so a close association in the text, with also with this woman, okay? And so we're into chapter, back into chapter 7 now. Um, chapter 7, verse 36. One of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him, and he went into the Pharisee's house and sat at table. And behold, a woman of the city who was a sinner, when she learned that he was sitting at table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of ointment. And standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears, and wiped them with the hair of her head, and kissed his feet, and anointed them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw it, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answering said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he answered, What is it, teacher? A certain creditor had two debtors, one owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he forgave them both. Now which of them will love him more? Simon answered, the one I suppose to whom he forgave more. And he said to him, you have judged rightly. Then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house, you gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. 
You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little loves little. And he said to her, Your sins are forgiven. Then those who were at table with him began to say among themselves, Who is this who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Okay. Here we're introduced, and notice right there in the chapter 8, of course those chapter and, and verse breaks are very late additions to the text. It was not origi original to the sacred scriptures. So the, the text flows then into that first three verses of chapter 8 where we're introduced into these women and to Mary Magdalene specifically from whom it says these demons were cast. And so this association between this sinful woman who comes and anoints his feet with oil and Mary Magdalene, the first association given by tradition. Mary Magdalene further is associated with, you'd be surprised, with almost every other woman, major woman, that's presented in the gospel stories. To see her as, in some sense, as the model, okay, or the icon of these women that had gone through this conversion. So first we have the sinful woman in chapter 7 of Luke. Further, the Samaritan woman, some have said. The Samaritan woman, who another tradition gives us is St. Photony, the enlightened one, at, in the Gospel of John chapter 4. You remember, our Lord comes to the well and says, give me a drink. And she says, how is it possible that a... That a Jew asks a Samaritan for a drink of water. And he says, if you knew who it was, ta was talking to you, you would have asked me, and I would have given you water, everlasting water, <coughs> running water, okay, living water. And so there's another association. Mary Magdalene as the sinful woman, Mary Magdalene as the Samaritan woman. These other women, we're not sure who they were, but we come to find out who Mary Magdalene is, and so she kind of, the conflagration of the two people. Further, to associate her as Mary, the sister of Martha. If you remember, Mary comes and she sits at our Lord's feet, is enthralled with what he's saying. Listen to what he's saying, well, Martha serves. It was that same Mary who, when our Lord came, when Lazarus had died, came to our Lord weeping and threw herself at his feet and said, Lord, if you had only been here, if you had only been here. And you know as the story goes, that our Lord then goes and raises Lazarus from the dead. The text says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? And they said to him, come and see. And Jesus wept. One chapter later, after that text of the raising of Lazarus in the Gospel of John, our Lord returns to the house of Mary and Martha and Lazarus to eat with them. It's, a, it's a, quite a disturbing text in the Gospel of John because if you know the Gospel, you know that the entire Gospel has been kind of rolling towards gaining momentum towards the crucifixion of Christ. And the Pharisees and the rest of the Jews have been setting themselves up against our Lord. And the battle is kind of coming to a head. And they finally come out in chapter 12 of the Gospel of John. And it says... They sought to kill Lazarus after he had been raised from the dead, lest more people go and follow Jesus. Okay. This is how evil these men were getting in their pursuit against Christ. Here a man had been raised from the dead and they sought to take his life back from him. You know, you get in the Gospels this, um, especially in John, this just clear division. Those that are on the side of life and those that are on the side of death. And the Pharisees show themselves to get worse and worse and over and over again, to be on the side of death until finally they seek what their goal, the crucifixion and death of their Lord. Mary Magdalene also, in the Gospel of Mark, if you're writing it down, it's chapter 16. You don't have to turn there right now. Mary Magdalene comes to the tomb as a myrrh bearer to anoint the body of our Lord, similar in the Gospel of John. But it says explicitly in Mark, she came there to anoint the body of our Lord. And it's there that you get that association between the sinful woman in the Gospel of Luke, who anoints the feet of Jesus, Mary, the sister of Lazarus, and Martha, who anoints our Lord in John chapter 12, and then now Mary Magdalene, who also anoints, goes to seek to anoint the dead body of our Lord. Yes, ma'am. 
in, uh, in Mark 16, Mark chapter 16. We know one other little point about Mary Magdalene from the scriptures. And that is that Magdalene is not her last name. Okay? What is it? It's the town she's from. She's Mary of Magdalene. Well, it depends on what language you're in. Magdalene or Magdalena, okay? Um, or Mejdel. It's a, one of the towns on the northwestern coast of the Sea of Galilee. And if you've been on the Sea of Galilee, you've probably driven right by it. It's a little tiny village there, not far from Capernaum, where our Lord was staying. You know, if you walk along the seashore of the Sea of Galilee, you come along there, and there's just these little springs coming out of the hills and in the valleys and so forth. And these are places where, no doubt, our Lord would have stopped with his disciples, spent the night, okay, would have taken his boat and found the fresh water there to drink from, to bathe. And this city would have been one of those little, or this town, a little town alongside the coast, not far from where he was staying at the house of Peter. No doubt would have been one of the places where they would have gone on a day's journey. You know, probably a few hours walk, okay? I didn't quite walk all the way there, but I walked along that section, and it wouldn't have taken very long to get there. So Mary would have come into contact with our Lord. She would have known, I mean, she was living right in that area. The town itself was known for its licentious living, the loose living of its people. And in fact, in 75 AD, the Romans destroyed the city for that fact. It was known for this, just this kind of, just a, a bad way. Huh? And the Romans, uh, being virtuous people for the most part, at least then, um, turned against the city and destroyed it, burned it to the ground. And so it gives another little insight of why tradition had seen her in this way, this light as being a harlot. So there you go. That's, a, that's about what we know from the sacred scriptures themselves. St. Gregory the Great, Pope of Rome, who we're going to be studying, by the way, in like two months. We have two talks coming on Pope Gregory the Great. And he says this. It's a, a, in a homily given in uh, the year 591 in the Basilica of San Clemente. Anybody may have been to San Clemente in Rome? San Clemente is one of the treasures of Christendom. One of the earliest churches still intact in Rome. And a beautiful mosaic of the tree of life there. It three levels, the early pagan temple upon which the early Christian church was built. And then on top of that, the modern day San Clemente. But modern day San Clemente is like 4th century or something. I don't know, it's very early. Beautiful, beautiful church. But he says this, She whom Luke calls the sinful woman, okay, what we read from, from Luke chapter 7, she who Luke calls the sinful woman who anointed the Lord's feet, whom John calls Mary, sister of Martha and Lazarus, we believe to be the Mary from whom seven devils were ejected according to Mark. And what do these seven devils signify, if not all the vices? It is clear, brothers, that the woman previously used the unguent to perfume her flesh in forbidden acts. What she therefore displayed more scandalously, she was now offering to God in a more praiseworthy manner. She had coveted with earthly eyes, but now through penitence, these eyes are consumed with tears. She displayed her hair to set off her face, but now her hair dries her tears. She had spoken proud things with her mouth, but in kissing the Lord's feet, she now planted her mouth on the Redeemer. For every delight, therefore, she had in herself, she now emulated herself. She turned the mass of her crimes to virtues in order to serve God entirely in penitence, for as much as she had wrongly held God in contempt. Beyond the question of who Mary Magdalene was, whether she was the sister of Lazarus or the sinful woman in chapter 7, there is a tradition which is, I think, even more helpful that takes us back into the Old Testament, and that is the tradition of seeing Mary Magdalene as a type of the fallen Eve, taking us back all the way to the book of Genesis. As you know, those of you who have studied scripture with me before, I always say, you got to go back to Genesis if you're going to found yourself well to interpret the New Testament. Never forget... Christ came to save us. We call him our Savior. Therefore, he must save us 
from something. And the thing which he saves us from is the fall. Period. That's why Christ came. That's what he did. Everything else is tangential. That's what he came for, and that's what he accomplished. When Christ came, he came to reverse what Adam and Eve had done in the fall. And so, a tradition which goes back to the earliest days of the church of seeing Mary Magdalene as a type of Eve, and therefore interpreting what Mary Magdalene does in the text that we learn about her, primarily in the text of the resurrection, which she plays a major part, seeing that text and her actions in light of the fall and in the light of what Eve did in the fall. Just as St. Paul, I don't want to miss anything in my notes, because each part is very important. Just as St. Paul saw Christ as the new Adam, so similarly, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of God are seen in the light of this. That if Adam is going to be restored, he's not the only one that needs restoration. Huh? Also, Eve, who played a part in our fall, must be restored. St. Hippolytus of Rome, writing at the turn of the early 3rd century, says... And so that the women did not doubt the angels, Christ himself appeared to them, so that they might become Christ's apostles. I've been telling you guys this the last few weeks. Mary Magdalene is called the apostle to the apostles. She is the one that's sent to the apostles to tell them the truth of the resurrection. And so that the women did not doubt the angels, Christ himself appeared to them, so that they might become Christ's apostles, and compensate through their obedience... For the sin of the first Eve. So that what Mary Magdalene does in the resurrection compensates in some way. Makes up, reverses what took place in the fall. Reverses the role of Eve in our destruction. Does that make sense? More commonly, and most likely you've heard this, is to see Mary, the mother of God, the Virgin Mary in that very role. In fact, St. Justin Martyr, St. Irenaeus, Tertullian, and others put Mary in that very position. Mary as the new Eve. Tertullian says this, God recovered his image and likeness, which the devil had seized by a rival operation. For unto Eve as yet a virgin had crept the word, which was the framer of death. You remember the devil spoke, and we'll, speak, we'll talk about this in a minute. The devil spoke his words of deceit into the ear of Eve, and she obeyed. For unto Eve as yet a virgin had crept the word which was the framework of death. Equally into a virgin was to be introduced the word of God, which was the builder up of life, that what by that sex had gone into perdition, by that same sex might be brought back to salvation. Eve had believed the serpent, Mary believed the archangel Gabriel. The fault which the one committed by believing, the other by believing has blotted out. Isn't that beautiful? God sees the problem and he deals with it in all its aspects, down to the smallest detail. So that you can take, if you know the fall well, and you can turn it on its head, and you can see the gospel story. Speaking of turning it on its head, I meant to, to begin with something about this, because Mary Magdalene <laughs> has been under some fire of late with the ridiculous books of Dan Brown and introducing us into, into our modern society all sorts of questions about the virtuous life of Christ okay, and further the virtuous life of Mary Magdalene as she came to our Lord. The devil always begins by twisting the truth ever so slightly. Do you remember when, in the story of the fall, when the serpent comes to Eve? And what's the first question he asks? Did God tell you you can't eat of any of the trees of the garden? Did God tell him that? No. No. And Mary says, no, no, he just said well, we can't eat of this one tree. But do you see that the devil has introduced an idea about God? That God created Adam and Eve, and then withdrew the very necessities of life. He, the devil, made God out to be the devil. To be the one who seeks the death of mankind. By introducing just the slightest twist upon the truth. 
And then he goes with a frontal attack and says, if you eat of the tree, this is wrong. If you eat of the tree, you will be like God. Completely then contradicting God's word. And that's exactly what happens with Mary Magdalene today. Something that is very true and very beautiful, namely the love, the relationship which Mary Magdalene and our Lord shared, which we're going to be introduced to in the resurrection account. A very beautiful relationship. A very beautiful relationship of love. A relationship which was founded in the Old Testament. It's founded in the covenant relationship between God and His people. It's the reason why God came to restore us to that relationship with Himself that we might have life again. The devil introduces a little error. Twists the truth ever so slightly. So that as we look at Mary Magdalene, the two stories will seem to run parallel, side by side at the beginning. There's a relationship of love between the two. But in the end, the conclusion couldn't be more different. I was driving down the freeway today with a priest, and we, I was talking with him about this. And I'm driving down 45, and there it is, the split. That thing comes up, and it's got two arrows like this, okay? Yeah, right. And I thought, you see how good God is? There's the picture. The two roads are running so close together, and yet they split, and they go in completely opposite directions in the end. And that's exactly what takes place with Mary Magdalene. In Christian Syria, with that area that we've been talking about with St. Ignatius of Antioch and so forth, in that area, by the 500s at least, there was a superimposition of the two people that we're speaking of here. Mary, the mother of God, as the new Eve, and Mary Magdalene as the new Eve. And therefore, a bringing together of the two people. Just as Mary Magdalene had been seen in association with the Samaritan woman, with the adulterous woman in the Gospel of John, and so forth. Similarly, in Christian Syria by 500, this bringing together of Mary the mother of God and Mary Magdalene. And you might say, no, that's just going too far. Right? For Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of God have some things which are very different, don't they? But here's the thing. Just like that, those arrows on the freeway began close together and split apart. Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of God start from two separate points, huh? But in the end, come together. <clears throat> Mary Magdalene is able to act in a way, in the story of our salvation, in a way that Mary, the mother of God, could never act, could never fulfill. And that is the role of the fallen Eve. Mary Magdalene, therefore, becomes, in some sense, a bridge. A bridge between the fallen Eve and the new Eve, the mother of God. This position in which I would say most of us find ourselves in. The one who is on a journey to her Lord. And it's that parallel, that connection, which those Christians of, of Syria, by the way, 500 at the time, St. Ephraim the Syrian, they were doing great biblical acts of Jesus. Some of the best that's ever been done in the history of the church. And so it gives us this place of Mary Magdalene in our salvation, leading away from the fallen Eve and towards Say, the new Eve, the mother of God. To fully grasp this, we have to turn back to the book of Genesis. So let's go back there for a second. We're going to turn back to Genesis, and I just need to walk you through the text very quickly, because we don't have much time. We're introduced, first of all, into the creation account, Genesis chapter 1. And in the, in the creation account of Genesis chapter 1, God creates in a framework uses somewhat of a literary device in chapter 1, creating within the framework of how many days? Seven days. Actually, six days, right? And on the seventh day, God rested. And as the fathers have told us, the God, when God rested on the seventh day, it was not just for God himself alone. For man and woman had been made in the image and likeness of God. What does God do when he rests on the seventh day? What does it tell us at the beginning of chapter 2? What does God do when he rests on the seventh day, Melanie? Blessings. What does he do? Blessings. And? 
Sanctified. Sanctified. Fine. God bless us. He doesn't sit back with a Coors Light on the couch. Okay? When it says that God rested, it's using, um, say, human terms, trying to relate the reality which is taking place here on the seventh day. And what reality is that? When God rests, he blesses, he sanctifies creation. When someone blesses something, when Father blesses you or blesses something, he makes that thing to participate in who and what God is himself. He makes the thing holy, and God alone is holy. When God blesses creation, he calls creation into what we might call a covenant relationship with himself. In a covenant, always, two parties become one. We talk about marriage, right? Two, the two become one. This always happens in a covenant relationship. This is what a covenant is. Two parties join together to share things in common. And when God covenants himself to creation, when he blesses and sanctifies it, he calls creation to participate in who and what he is. Friends, this is the reason why we have the sacraments in the church. If there are any Protestants among us tonight, I'm sorry, but you're missing the whole game. God came to sanctify creation. This was his intention in the beginning, to share his life in love with that which he created. This is why oil, water, bread, wine is used in the church to give us salvation. This was God's plan in the beginning. That we would communicate, that we would share his life through creation. That he would reveal himself to us through the things we could touch, through the things we could see, through the things we could taste, and so forth. This is salvation. This is what Christ came to give us. And this was God's plan in the beginning. Like I said, that resting in God was not made for God alone, but man and woman made in the image and likeness of God were also called to bless to sanctify creation, namely, to enter into a covenant relationship with creation in the image of the creator of the world. And at the high point, to enter into a covenant relationship with each other and with God. As some of the fathers have pointed out, Adam is created he wakes up, he beholds his creator. And it's then that God puts him into that deep sleep. And if you follow the timeline of chapter 1 of Genesis and apply it to the story of the Garden of Eden in chapter 2 of Genesis, it would make sense that when Adam was put to sleep for the first time, for his first rest, if you will, and Eve was taken forth from himself, from his rib on the evening of that first day of their existence, on the sixth day of creation, being created on the sixth day, she then opened her eyes and they beheld each other for the first time on the seventh day, on the day of covenant, the day in which mankind was meant to enter into a covenant relationship with God and being his image and likeness, to enter into a covenant relationship with each other into the marital bond by which they would participate in the creative act of God. In fact, the root word in Hebrew for the number seven is Sheva, for seven, but it's also the same root for the word oath or covenant. This is why the creation is done within a seven-day structure, why that literary device is used to communicate something more to us. Well, at least it communicated to the people that spoke Hebrew, that understood this type of a culture. In Genesis chapter, uh, chapter 3, we get the text of the fall. And I'm going to go very quickly through this in that light. That man was meant to enter into this covenant relationship with God and with each other on the seventh day. Chapter 2, verse 23. Then the man said, this is bone of my bone. Flesh of my flesh, so that she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore a man leaves his father and his mother, cleaves to his wife, and they become one flesh. There it is. And the man and his wife were both naked and not ashamed. Now the serpent was more subtle than any other creature that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God say to you? And so forth. And she said back to him. 
for the Jewish people to enter into a conversation with something they say much more important than it might be for us today. For them to enter into a conversation with another person is to enter into a covenant relationship with that other person. We see that with the text of the Samaritan woman in the Gospel of John chapter 4. The apostles are horrified that our Lord is only is speaking, not just with a Samaritan, but with a woman. Okay? Because to speak is to communicate something of yourself. It is. Think about it. You share something which is inside of you with another who receives it inside of them. So that what was yours is now theirs, and what is theirs is now yours. The two have become one. And here, in the beginning of all things, when Eve opens her eyes and Adam beholds his bride for the first time, when we would have expected to see on the seventh day the worship and praise of God with the voice of man, and the communication of oneself to another in the marital union between Adam and Eve, that divine conversation between husband and wife, we get an illicit conversation between Eve and the serpent. Speaking one to the other, a conversation which should never have taken place. St. John Christendom says, what was the woman doing speaking to the serpent in the first place? She should have been speaking with the one for whom she had been made and with whom she shared all things on equal terms. She should have entered into a relationship with Adam and to a relationship with God. And where was Adam? What was he doing? In the text, in the Hebrew text of Genesis, the serpent speaks in the plural to Eve, indicating that most likely there was more than one person there. But that it was Eve who stood up and spoke as, in a sense, the head of mankind. And Adam, who was given one task to keep the garden, to guard the gates, failed in his covenant obligation with his bride. He failed to till and keep the garden. He failed to be the gardener of paradise in the image of the one who had planted paradise in the beginning. At that point, then, the relationship is broken apart. St. Ephraim says, She, Eve, went after that which her eyes desired, and being enticed by the divinity that the serpent promised her, she stole away from her husband and ate, and afterwards she gave some to her husband and he ate, because she believed the serpent she ate first, thinking that she would be clothed with divinity in the presence of the one from whom she as woman had been separated. She hastened to eat before her husband that she might become head over her head. That she might be older in divinity than the one who was older than her in humanity. You see in the fall a reversal of the divinely established order. Eve feeds Adam, the one who should have been tilling and keeping the garden and feeding his wife. She speaks in the place of the one who should have protected her. And so we get in a, what, I, what I like to call the first divorce, the breaking apart of that relationship which God has designed for us. It's that issue that Jesus Christ has come to solve. It's that problem which he is going to come and reverse, which he is going to come and make up for. And it's that problem that we see him solving in the Gospels and primarily in the resurrection account. Let's turn then quickly to the Gospel of John, chapter 1. You're thinking, uh oh, he's going to start at the beginning of the Gospels. Well, I'll go fast. <laughs> start reading, Melanie. Fast. Go. go. Chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through him, and without him was made nothing that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shined in the darkness, and the darkness could not comprehend it. In the beginning was the word. John places in the beginning of his gospel something of a stop sign, I believe, saying, no, 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 do not continue to read until you understand the problem, because what you're about to read is chapter two, or the last chapter in the book where he solves the problem that began in the beginning. John recalls us to that imagery then. 
And in chapter 1, verse 24 of the Gospel of John, we get the story of the baptism of our Lord. And you know the text well. Our Lord descends into the Jordan River. And he comes forth from, those, from the Jordan. This Holy Spirit descends upon him. And we hear those haunting words. Behold my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. The great mystery of the baptism of our Lord is not that the Father speaks of the Word of God as His Son. This is a reality that has been true from all eternity. But the great mystery is that the Father looks upon a man, the God-man Jesus Christ, and says for the first time since the Genesis account, This, this is my Son, a man who has been created in my image and in my likeness. In chapter 3 of the Gospel of John, we get John the Baptist's words. You guys want the verse, don't you? <laughs> chapter 3, verse 28. Let's go back to verse 27. John answered, No one can receive anything except what is given him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. He who is the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bride, at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now full. He must increase and I must decrease. Our Lord, the divine bridegroom of mankind, has come. And he has come for a purpose. And the purpose is to find his bride, the church, mankind. To bring them back into a covenant relationship with himself that they might share in what he and he alone has, namely eternal life. To give them back that which they lost at the fall. This is why our Lord came. This is what the Gospel of John is trying to communicate to us. To put us back in the context of paradise. To see the divine garden solve the problem. To go and do what Adam failed to do in the beginning. To go to battle against the devil. To go to battle against Satan, the serpent. And to strike a decisive blow against him. To free us from his bond. And to give us back that which we lost. At the end of all things, at the conclusion of the gospel, when all of the history of the world, both before and after, are summed up, this is exactly what our Lord does. Father James Groening, in his book, The Passion of Jesus, says, For the beginning of his passion, he chose a wonderfully beautiful garden. How significant this choice was. In a garden, the first Adam had committed the first sin, the sin of disobedience. Therefore, it was in a garden that the second Adam should say to his father, Not what I will, but what thou wilt. In a garden, Adam, by an abuse of liberty, had plunged the entire human race into a shame, most shameful captivity. In a garden, therefore, by the bonds of Christ, our fetters were to be broken. In a garden, God had pronounced the death penalty upon Adam. Hence, in a garden, Christ would take upon himself the judgment and the curse. In a garden, the human race was lost. And therefore, an object is usually sought where it was lost. St. Ephraim says in his Nisbean hymns, Our Lord subdued his might, and they seized him so that by his living death he might give life to Adam. He gave his hands to be pierced by the nails in place of that hand that had plucked the fruit. He was struck on the cheek in the judgment hall in return for that mouth that had devoured in Eden. Our Lord was stripped naked so that we might be clothed in modesty. With gall and vinegar he, was, he made sweet that bitter venom that the serpent had poured into mankind. Turn your text, Gospel of John, to chapter 19. Listen to the language that John uses and what he points out. I'm not meaning to say that John made this up by any means. No, but what he pays attention to. The details he pays attention to in the story of the resurrection of our Lord. Melanie, chapter 19, verse, uh, verse 38 through 20, verse 1. After this, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly, for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave him leave. So he came and took away his body. Nicodemus also, who had at first come to him by night, 
came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pounds weight. They took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen cloths with the spices, as is the burial custom of the Jews. Now in the place where he was crucified there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb where no one had ever been laid. So because of the Jewish day of preparation, as the tomb was close at hand, they laid Jesus there. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early, while it was still dark, and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Okay. St. Ephraim says, Christ's tomb and the garden are symbols of Eden, where Adam died a hidden death. For he had fled and hidden himself among the trees, as though he had entered a tomb and been covered over. The living one, once entombed, has now risen in the garden, and raised up Adam, who had fallen in the garden. From a tomb does Christ bring Adam in glory into the marriage feast of the garden of paradise. Do you think it's an accident? John begins his gospel in the beginning, and he begins his resurrection account in the garden. Notice in chapter 20, verse 1, Mary Magdalene comes to the tomb early, while it was still dark. On what day of the week? The first day of the week. And it is dark. What happened on the first day of creation in the book of Genesis? God created the light. And the light shined in the darkness. And the darkness fled. If you know the story of the creation, you know the story of the resurrection. Because this is the story of what takes place. Mary Magdalene comes to the tomb while it is still dark. Let's read that text again from verse 1, Melanie, now through verse 11. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Peter then came out with the other disciple, and they went toward the tomb. They both ran, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying, and the napkin which had been on his head, not lying with the linen cloths, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not know the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. I think it's helpful now to return quickly to remember to be reading this text in the light of the fall, in the light of the traditional understanding of seeing Mary Magdalene as a type of Eve. I oftentimes think what it must have been like. I don't know if Eve outlived Adam or not. It doesn't say in the book of Genesis. But if she did, what it must have been like for her to be there, on the edge of the Garden of Eden, as tradition says, they did not go far. They stood waiting at the edge of paradise, outside of the gates, weeping and beating their breast, asking for repentance. And here Adam died, on the outside of the gates of paradise. And what it must have been like for Eve to be there, to hold her husband, and to know as he grew old and sick and died, that she had a hand in his death. Similarly, Mary Magdalene came to our Lord, repenting. She had lived a life apart from God, apart from her true husband, the one who called her and all of mankind to share his life with them. And what it must have been like to see her Lord, the one she had left everything to follow as the scriptures tell us. The one she had served day in and day out to be hanging upon the cross and to know that she had a hand, as we do, in his crucifixion and his death. And she stood there while the other apostles went home. And she stood there and she wept. Where else could she go 
I can say, where else would Eve go? The one for whom she had been made, the one with whom she shared all things on equal terms, was dead. But worse than that, Mary Magdalene didn't even have his dead body to anoint. And she wept. St. Gregory the Great says, When Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and did not find the Lord's body, she thought it had been taken away and so informed the disciples. I'm sorry, I've got to start with St. Augustine just before that. The eyes that had sought for the Lord and had not found him were now free for tears, grieving more that he had been taken away from the sepulcher than that he had been slain on the wooden cross, since now not even a memorial place was left behind. And now St. Gregory the Great. When Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and did not find the Lord's body, she thought it had been taken away and so informed the disciples. Afterwards, they came and saw the tomb. They too believed what Mary had told them. The text then says the disciples went back home and it adds, but Mary wept and remained standing outside the tomb. We should reflect on Mary's attitude and the great love she felt for Christ. For though the disciples had left the tomb, she remained. She was still seeking the one she had not found. And while she sought, she wept. Burning with the fire of love, she longed for him who she thought had been taken away. And so it happened that the woman who stayed behind to see Christ was the only one to see him. For perseverance is essential to any good deed, as the voice of truth tells us. Whoever perseveres to the end will be saved. <clears throat> Let's read now through verse 15. We're going to start with verse 10. Then the disciples went back to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb, and as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white, sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Saying this, she turned round and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom do you seek? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to them, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. A modern commentary had great insight into this. Is, did Mary suppose that he was the gardener? She was wrong, and yet she was also right. He was a gardener. Not as she supposed him, but this was the gardener who placed Adam and Eve in paradise who provided an Eden for them of every kind of flowering tree and fruitful vine. This was the original gardener who created us in his image and likeness, who gave to us through Adam and Eve the invitation to union with God, and was now going to restore us to the garden from which we had been banished. On the back page of your text there, the same commentator continues, and I'll, I'll just read it to you. Your text starts, when, when did Mary, is that correct? Yeah. When did Mary no longer see the gardener, but to see the risen Son of God? When did her eyes finally perceive that he was not a caretaker, a custodian, that he was not a maintenance worker, but the divine Son of the living God, the risen Christ? I needed to read you just a couple more verses in John here. Verse 15, chapter 20, verse 15. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom do you seek? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. And Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold me, for I have not yet ascended to my father. But go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my father and to your father, my God and to your God. St. John's Gospel tells us that when Jesus uttered to her but one word, her eyes were opened. And the word that he uttered was simply her name, Mary. No one can reproduce the timbre of the Savior's voice, its warmth, its resonance, its cadence. But it was a sound that came from his lips, a sound which revealed in its speaking the depth of the love in his heart. There is a way of naming someone that is greater than sound, the speaking of the name, more accurate than syllables, more expressive than words. And Jesus, the divine teacher, who held the crowd spellbound for years, 
who spoke as no one had ever spoke, spoke but one word. By a single word, he captured her. He grasped her. He identified her. He knew her. Her whole being was, as it were, laid before him in a moment, and she was quickened by his naming her, Mary. To be known and yet to be loved, to be well-known and to be well-loved, to be seen and to be called out, to be named and identified with intimate love, that's what Jesus conveyed by a single word. And in a single moment, Mary knew that no one else could love like that but him. Mary knew that no one knew her heart and soul like that but him. How well she knew that no one else could speak her name like that but him. She said to him, Rabboni. St. John tells us that the word Rabboni means teacher. Actually, the word rabbi means teacher. Rabboni is the familiar form of the word in Aramaic, which denotes the meaning, my teacher. It's personal. Mine. He belongs to me. Mary, Jesus said, my teacher, she answered. It was a kind of betrothal of the divine heart to the heart of this woman. They named each other. That's how she recognized him, by the sound of her name. Verse 17, Jesus said to her, Do not hold me, for I have not yet ascended to my Father. But go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and to your Father, to my God and to your God. Mary Magdalene went and said to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and she told them all that he had said to her these things. I'll conclude with a quotation from the great Dom Prosper Garanger. On that great Easter day, Magdalene, like a morning star, announced the rising of the Son of Justice, who is never more to set. Woman, said Jesus to her, why weepest thou? Thou art not mistaken, he seemed to say. It is indeed the divine gardener speaking to thee, the same that planted Eden in the beginning. But now dry thy tears in this new garden, whose center is an empty tomb. Paradise is restored. The angels no longer close the entrance. Here is the tree of life, which has borne fruit these three days past. This fruit which thou, O woman, art eager as of old to seize and taste, belongs to thee now by right, for thou art no longer Eve, but Mary. If thou art bidden not to touch it yet, it is because as thou wouldst not heretofore taste the fruit of death thyself alone, thou mayest not now enjoy the fruit of life, till thou bringest back him who was first lost through thee. Go and get the apostles. I want to encourage you that if you plan on missing the Easter vigil, don't. <laughs> Go early to the tomb while it is still dark. Run to the tomb with Mary Magdalene. Last time I presented this talk was two years ago, and I said this that it is one of the great desires of my life to go to Jerusalem and to run from the sepulcher to the upper room and then to run back again. I got to do that this last year. And I did. I ran. It took about 12 minutes. And I was out of breath. Mary Magdalene did it in the middle of the night while it was still dark. And when she got to the tomb, she was the only one who got to see the rising of the Son of Justice. If you want to see Jesus Christ rise from the dead, you've got to go to the tomb. You have to go with desire. You have to prepare yourself. You have to weep at his tomb and wait until everyone else has given up hope. And then our Lord will do for you what he has promised. He will come and he will make his home in your heart and he will rise. And as St. Paul says, death no longer has dominion over him. And therefore, death will no longer have dominion over you. Thank you very much for coming tonight.
the adulterous woman. Yeah. yeah John she, chapter eight. Yes, she's, she's one of the. Mary well, it's one of the people. They said we don't know her name, and therefore we tra they transferred this. It's very common, you know, in the in the early church to be looking at the scriptures in this way that kind of transcended our modern understanding of the scripture. We're reading is history. It's more than history, mm -hmm. and so is, we 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 learn from the fathers, well, and from the Jews before them, this art of typology by which we see the fulfillment of God's works in this kind of many different manifestations. So that um, we can talk about Mary as the new Eve, we can also talk about her as the new Moses. Because God gave the law to Moses, and he gave the new law to the Virgin Mary. In some ways, Mary embodies everything that Moses was about. Right? And so she really is the new Moses. And, and not just like she's like Moses, but she receives the gift of God like Moses received the gift of God. And therefore, the same thing is engendered in her as was engendered in Moses. We see the same revelation of God in a sense. Okay? And so this practice, this art of typology, um, finding these different images, these different people, the same revelation. Right? We're baptized as the, as the Jews were baptized in the Red Sea. We receive the Eucharist and as Adam was to receive from the tree of life. It's the same mystery of God revealed in a multitude of ways. And so it's not just, well, it's the, they were too stupid back then to figure out that these were two different people. I would say we're too stupid now to understand what they're talking about. Because the same mystery is taking place in Mary Magdalene as took place in the adulterous woman. Whether Mary Magdalene was a harlot or not. Because every time we walk away from God, we, in a sense, divorce ourselves from our Lord, from our husband. As the Samaritan woman did, with five, the, the text says, you have five husbands and the one you are with now is not your husband. The one she's with now is our Lord. Right? And the five husbands, if some point out, the Samaritans worship five male deities. Those who have gone through salvation history with me in the Old Testament know this. And the word there for, for Lord can be used in relationship to the pagan gods. Okay? And the word is Baal. Okay? And also for the Lord as husband. And so it can be taken both ways. Maybe the Samaritan woman did have five husbands. Or maybe our Lord is simply talking about the five pagan gods of the Samaritan people. By which they had separated themselves from the people of God, the true bride of the Lord, and had gone after other husbands, yoked themselves, covenanted themselves with these other lords. It's, a, it's, a sim, it's the same mystery re revealed in different people. And so when the, when the fathers start to conflate the two, it's because they understand that. And you see the beauty of what happens when they bring Mary Magdalene and Our Lady together, something that would at first would, oh, that would horrify us. But now... Magdalene is no more Eve, but Mary. Right? And, the, and what's being spoken of there by Don Prosper Garanger is, is this transition of herself from sinfulness to sinlessness. Because she stands now before our Lord and beholds him and follows him wherever he will go. Okay? Anyway, okay. Yes. Nice and loud. So, the same typology would apply for Mary in Egypt, right? I mean, who knows what her real name was? Thank you. I, you know... Salvation history does not end when we close the Bible. Salvation history is happening in this room right now tonight. And it's going to continue to happen during Holy Week. Huh? And when you come early in the morning, when it's still dark out, we light the Paschal fire, and we stand there, and we sing the hymns of our Lord, and we take that fire home. There's a beautiful tradition in the East, among the Eastern churches, of people taking the fire the, uh, from the church, the light, and taking it home with them. I encourage you to get on YouTube. And type in the resurrection, uh, the liturgy of the resurrection, or something like that, in Jerusalem. Okay, and find one that's really good to see what happens in the in the in the sepulchre of our Lord. The patriarch of Jerusalem goes in. The tradition he goes in every year with candles, thirty-three candles for the for every year of our Lord's life. Okay, and he goes in there, and they lock the doors on him. <laughs> happens every year. He comes out. The Holy Spirit descends upon the candles, and he comes out with those candles lit by the gift of the Holy Spirit. And there are thousands and thousands of people standing there to take the fire, and they run as fast as they can back to their village to be the first one to bring the light of Christ to their village. It's crazy, but it gives you a sense of the desire that needs to be there. 
Okay, I don't, what was your question? I'm sorry, where did you go? Salvation history continues. We stand at the resurrection on Easter, friends. The resurrection didn't happen 2,000 years ago. What Christ does, he does as God, and therefore he takes what is bound by time into the eternal day of the Lord, and those who are present to the Lord are present to Christ, and that is why we can be baptized into Jesus Christ. We can receive Holy Communion from the hand of Christ. We can stand and witness the resurrection just as the apostles did. Yes. The seven demons yes. driven out. Does that also mean seven was used as a term for multiple or all? Yeah, absolutely. So you could, um, it, well, this, this, it's, it's, and we all said number seven means perfection. No, the number seven means the perfect fulfillment of covenant union. And so you see, like in the book of Genesis, where you have seven generations from Adam, and, and you come to, um, to Lamech, thank you, um, who is the fulfillment of evil. If Cain was evil, Lamech was really, was in tradition says that Lamech murdered Cain. And so you see that fulfillment. So sure, absolutely, the seven demons from seven demons has said this could have meant in, this, in the literary text, the literary way these people were, were writing, right? The, this total union with, with the devil, with evil that she came from. Which, I mean, the seven demons, I mean, that's pretty bad right there. Okay? So that's a good point. Yeah. Okay, yes. Eve and Adam protector or shut from them. Does she have freedom of choice? Sure. Does she have freedom of choice? What I'm saying is that yes, Eve had freedom. Adam did too. I mean, I don't know, guys. Eve, you know, you want to talk about a good looking girl. I mean, she was made perfect, right? She was made sinless. She was beautiful in the image and likeness of God. What was Adam thinking? All right, so, yeah, I don't know. I, I personally think, you know, if I were Adam, I wouldn't have been very far away. If the catechism states, at the moment of the fall, Adam let the trust, his trust in God, die in his heart. And uh, I, I like that image of Lord of the Rings, okay? When Gandalf stands there at the, when, the, when that dragon's coming up, you remember that maybe some of you have seen it, the dragon's coming up to take... The, these guys that were the good guys, right? And Gandalf comes with a sword and throws it down. And he says, you shall not pass. That's what Adam was supposed to do. And that's exactly what our Lord did. No matter what you do to me, I will not fail my bride. I don't care if you crucify me on a cross. Because I trust in God. And I trust that he will not abandon me. And that he will raise me up and give me life. And that's what Adam failed. His trust in his heart to be the protector of his bride. And so, yes, she had freedom in Adam. They both, they both sinned, huh? They both sinned. <laughs> All right. We hope you enjoyed this presentation from the Institute of Catholic Culture. For more information, recorded programs, or schedules of upcoming events, visit our website at www.instituteofcatholicculture.org.